take your seats. of this global conclave, which is on panel on growth and human development linkages. The chairperson of this session is Professor Kaushik Basu, who is Professor of Economics, Cornell University, USA, and former Senior Vice President and Chief Economist, World Bank, Washington, DC, and former Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India. I request Professor Basu to please grace the dais. The panelists in this session are Lord Meghnath Desai, Professor Emeritus, London School of Economics, and member of the House of Lords, United Kingdom. Sir has already graced the dais. I invite Dr. Pedro Concesao, Director, Human Development Report Office, United Nations Development Program, New York, to please come on the dais. Dr. Sabina Alkaya, she's Director, Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, University of Oxford, United Kingdom. Request Ms. Alkaya to please grace the dais. Dr. Norbert Shaddy, who is Chief Economist of Human Development, the World Bank, Washington, DC. Request Dr. Shaddy once again on the dais, please. And the discussant in this session is Professor Sita Prabhu. She is a visiting professor Institute for Human Development, New Delhi, and former head of Human Development Resource Center, UNDP, India. And yes, now that we have all your attention, request all of you to kindly take your seats. I would now request Professor Kaushik Basu, with great respect, to kindly conduct this session. Thank you. I can go up there and yes. do this and then come back. We put this, if you need this, okay? No, it's not okay. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, pardon my slightly raspy voice, all tested negative, but the air doesn't help. Um, absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, it's a very important meeting because um, in many ways, I don't think Alak Sharma could have predicted it, that human development has become the core of the concern for economics today. And it's not just the sort of what's happened over the last five years, but it's with the change of technology and the linkage between human capital, human development, and growth opens up questions which I think are almost as dramatic as when, during the Industrial Revolution, technology was changing the world and we needed some of the most powerful thinkers to understand that world we were stepping into. So it's a wonderful gathering. I, um, thank you. The, for inviting me to chair this, what I did not know, but I'm absolutely delighted that the speakers, the discussants, are a gathering of people whom I've known for a long time, so it's almost like friends being invited to be here. My plan is the following, um, that I'm going to take no more than five minutes just introducing the speakers. Then for each of the speakers, roughly 20 minutes each, Okay, Alak Sharma has <laughs> nipped off 15 straight away, 15 minutes each, and uh, then Sita Prabhu uh, will get as a discussant 10 minutes. Uh, okay, Alak has agreed, so 10 minutes for you. <laughs> then I am very keen to open it up. I'm not going to speak very much. I had planned to speak a lot, but I have to give my voice some rest. I've got other things from the evening onwards. Um, I want to open it up from some discussion back and forth, right? A little bit of time on that. With that, let me very, very briefly, all these are very well-known speakers, introduce the speakers. Um, I was saying these are friends who, whom I've interacted with, but the very first speaker here is a friend subsequently, but Meghnath Desai, Lord Meghnath Desai, may not remember, he was my tutor at the London School of Economics when I had gone very briefly, then I changed my discipline, etc. Uh, when I joined the London School. But I have to tell you, it's nothing to do with this conference. My first meeting with Meghnath Desai was very unusual. I was a student in Delhi University. One day went to the coffee house and saw a man with a very strange hairdo, very, very colorful shirt, 
And I did comment with my friends, I wonder who this is. Looks like an intellectual, French left bank intellectual. That's it. No further conversation. Then I joined, go to the London School of Economics, undergraduate. I was called up and said that you've been assigned a tutor. This is Dr. Meghna Desai. This is his room number. Please go and see him. So I knock and go in. And I got a shock. The shock took a little bit of time because there were just heaps of books. As the books sort of moved out, and I saw, I saw the same man I had seen at the coffee house in Delhi. It has been a sheer delight. Early um, several months that he was my tutor, uh, Lord Desai's uh, scholarship from Srafa to Marxian economics to those days, Morishima was there at LSE. That landscape he straddled with great ease and comfort. So it's wonderful for me to be here with Meghnad Desai. The next person is someone, again, I interact a lot with, Pedro Consecao here from UNDP. And it's the Human Development Report. I'm not giving a formal introduction. With Pedro, I have to say this formal, this little bit of informal thing. You know, when you go to international organizations as an academic, as a professor, usually you take the academic wisdom there and they bring policy. But every time I sit down with Pedro, it's a scholarship which takes me aback. I pick up new references and I go away from philosophy to economics and his or original discipline, if I'm not mistaken, is physics. So it's quite amazing. Welcome over here. After that, we have Sabina al -Khaire. These are all friends from years ago. You know, multidimensional poverty. The one name, there are several people who work on it, but probably the one name most prominent in that multidimensional poverty is Sabina al -Khaire. friends from years ago. It's wonderful to see you here, Sabina. And then there's Norbert Shadi. Um, his, from the, my World Bank period, I've been familiar with him, but his work again, uh, very long ago, his work on child labor, which used to be a field of great interest, some of the most pioneering work on child labor he had done, so it's wonderful to see you here. Finally, uh, Sita Prabhu, as a discussant joining in, I'm again absolutely delighted. Once again, it's becoming too repetitive. I've known Sita Prabhu for a very long time. In the field of sustainable development, SDGs, and the broader dimension of development, one of the most prominent writers and contributors. So it's an amazing panel over here. I don't want to take up any more time. Let me, with this, call upon Lord Meghnad Desai to give his remarks and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Kaushik. Uh, thank you for your kind words. And it's a delight to be here because uh, uh, Sabina may or may not remember, but I was a PhD examiner. I think I think I think I failed. I failed, but she passed, so that's all right. So, uh, good, good, good to see you. Uh, I think you know, I, I'm I'm a ghost of Christmas past. Uh, sort of long, long, long ago. Uh, I was involved in this human development. So I want to tell you how it all happened. Because all I can do now is tell stories. I can't draw diagrams anymore. Uh, it was the, uh, in the 1980s, very, very bad period for, for development, especially for de development in Latin America and, and Africa. Because we had had a, a horrendous stagflation through the 1970s. Oil prices had, had, uh, had uh, quadrupled. And when people were in difficulty, and although Ronald Reagan, as president, was uh, was spending money like there was no tomorrow and a huge budget deficit, I am after the view that developing countries should not have deficits. So we had Washington consensus. So you know how you had to be absolutely orthodox, and no progressive taxation, balanced budgets, and so on. It was in that context that Mexican debt crisis happened. And the Economic Commission for Latin America came to Amartya Sen uh, for answer to all problems. You go to Amartya Sen. Uh, so, uh, and they said they wanted him to uh, develop an alternative idea about development. And Amartya, being a very busy man, he said yes. But well, you know, he, he he needs a bit of help, or you know, he wanted an assistant. So I became an assistant to Amartya Sen. 
uh, about this. And so we visited uh, uh, Santiago uh, and talked talk to some, some people there. Uh, Julio Boltwinik, who, who was a Colombian economist, he was there. I forget the name of the man who was the head of ECL at that time. But eventually, so we decided to do something. And then that ECLA got taken over by UNDP New York. Because Mambubul Haq, Dr. Mambubul Haq, uh, whom some of you uh, will remember, uh, he and Amartya had been students uh, at Cambridge together back in the 50s. And uh, so Mambub called Amartya to come to New York because he wanted to launch a new idea of development. And so we had a meeting, and I was, I was the, you know, accompanying Amartya. And in the middle of this meeting, Mambo announced without any notice to, at least to me, that uh, Professor Sen and Professor Desai were going to uh, announce a new paradigm of development. And I thought, what the hell is going on here? Why, why, why is this man doing this? But then Mambo was Mambo. Uh, so and, uh, on, on the spot, Amartya, of course, gave a brilliant account of what kind of development it could be, I had no idea what I was going to say. So I said something about numbers and statistics and things like that. Remember? And then we had to uh, invent something. So around about September 1989, in a, in a sort of side road to the UNDP's office, we had a meeting. Uh, we were about, about 10 of us. Amatya was there, I was there. Uh, uh, Francis Stewart was there. Francis Stewart from Oxford was there. There was a, a man whose name I forget, who's Master of Modern, uh, Modern College, Oxford. He was an American who just sort of, and uh, he was there. There was an economist from Bangladesh. Uh, Saras Menon was there, who works for UNDP, and Inga Kohl, uh, who was, as it were, the, the, the mover and shaker of the UNDP. And we sat there and we kind of exchanged ideas. And you know, in a sense, uh, what it finally ended up to be, if, uh, if I may say so, was the sort of, uh, among people who had been doing development, not, not myself so much, but I see Francis Stewart and, and various people, uh, we decided we had to have some, some simple ideas which had to have sort of a lot of uh, uh, punch packed into them. And so after, some some debate. Uh, we decided that there was this, uh, you know, like a, like the three kings of Orient, bearing uh, you know gold, incense, and myrrh uh, to, to Christ. If you all remember your Bible, uh, we we had uh, three things. We had life expectancy, uh, educational enrollment, and per capita income. And in a sense, people were well, when the f big meeting was held in UNDP. People were saying, you're not going to invent a new uh, paradigm of development. You're going to come back with GNP per capita, nothing else. So there was a lot of skepticism at that time. Anything could happen. But anyway, we, we persisted, and we invented uh, this uh, triad of uh, uh, development. And I think what ultimately it did, as many people have said, it changed the way people thought about economic development. Because in a sense, what was happening at that time, uh, generally in economics, was that there had been a battle between Keynesian economics and uh, monetarism. And Keynesian economics was losing. Was losing its, its sort of, you know, its uh, alarm in the 1970s, 1980s. But none of us liked monetarism. So where were we going to go? And in a sense, from in that particular battle, it was very good to take development uh, away from simple macroeconomic Keynesian type variables and shift uh, the attention to something very different but very important to lives and livelihoods. And I think uh, what really proved uh, to be very effective was the fact that we had life expectancy as, as a very central uh, uh, variable there. And that is not so much because it tells you how long you're going to live, uh, as people think it does, but it tells you something about uh, infant mortality. That any society which has overcome infant mortality, which is sort of a sign of public health, a sign of general, general prosperity, uh, 
if you can get, if you can reduce infant mortality, your life expectancy is going to go up. Uh, then, of course, uh, education is obviously about the future, the future of the current young generation. And so if you want to worry about development, you have to worry about the future. And then we, of course, had to have something about uh, income, so we had GDP. But if you look at the first uh, human development report, which is, I have to say, I did not write it. It's an absolute classic. It's one of the great classic books uh, on, on human development. In that, there is a, there is a little uh, uh, sort of technical note, which is not signed, but Amartya Sen wrote it, which says that it should not be per capita income. It should be per capita income multiplied by one minus the Gini coefficient, i.e., you don't just look at per capita income, you look at inequality as well. And so that, that, the very three simple variables somehow proved to be magic because it took the uh, discussion away from inflation and you know, balance of payments and all those things. That it said, look, development is really about what is happening to people, not just what's happening to things. You know, GDP is all about what's happening to things, your supply and demand and so on. This is about the quality of life. What is the quality of life right now? And what is the future of the people going to be given what the current circumstances are? And so I think, in a sense, it, it was it's a very powerful way of diverting attention from the narrow IMF type considerations in, in which uh, in sort of exchange rates and, and taxes and money dominated to Human, human lives. And so obviously, uh, I think what we have done, uh, looking at this gathering, uh, started something like a pandemic. And 40 years later, we, sti we still have uh, people st doing human development. And the nice thing about a paradigm like that is that uh, uh, us, the older generation, can get out of the way so people, people younger can uh, do this. I, I did uh, human development for about 10 years. Uh, and it's very interesting. Someone, I think, mentioned uh, freedom earlier on, how freedom was a part of it. Well, freedom actually is not originally a part of it. But what happened in the first ranking, you see, ranking, is, ranking actually did the trick. Ranking countries by human development achievement made every country, every prime minister look at first thing, where is my country in this league? And why is my country lower than the, my favorite enemy? Uh, you, know, you know, Algeria and Morocco uh, had, to, had to be both reconciled by Mabu as to why one was about the other and so on. Anyway, the Human Development uh, uh, Index, when it came out, uh, did not have USA at the top. And that was a crisis. Uh, Bill, somebody or the third, I forget the name now. He was appointed by George W. Bush to head uh, at the UNDP. So he said to Mahbub, Mahbub, you know what the problem is. You don't have freedom. You must have freedom in this index so that America will be at the top. So unfortunately, that, that was a time when we were having a, some problems in the Middle East. So Mahbub had to go back, and I was left in charge of, uh, of this, this mess. So I said, OK, uh, freedom is basically how well you respect human rights. So we made up an uh, index of freedom based on, on adherence of a country to human rights. And you don't believe the amount of fuss it caused in the UNDP. Every country which had low ranking denounced us as being able to define freedom, who do you think you are, and so on. And uh, there are the problems about uh, you know, the countries you can, you can think of immediately. Uh, and uh, we finally had to uh, not publish the actual scores of achievement of human rights uh, uh, adherence by countries. But we had to, as it were, kind of do uh, continent-wise numbers and some, some sort of fudge or other, I forget. I, I, I did finally publish real numbers somewhere else. But, uh, the idea was it not that our numbers were wrong, but UNDP had no local standby in the matter of human rights. 
and therefore human, uh, UND, UNDP cannot publish. Anyway, uh, this can go on. Uh, so, uh, no, I think it is quite remarkable that uh, what, what, uh, what we started, uh, and in a sense, it is interesting that basically, as someone also said earlier session, it is the way the South came into economics in a big way. You know, we have had economy, very distinguished economists from the South. After all, Dada Ben Navroji invented the whole idea about poverty and, uh, and national income and so on. But it was the combination of Amar Jassar and Mahbub Bulhak. Uh, who had a very different perspective <coughs> on what economics is all about. Uh, that, you know, I remember uh, Mahbub saying to Amartya, uh, Mahbub told me that when he saw Amartya on the first day of term at Cambridge, uh, Amartya said, we have to learn this thing if you are going to destroy it properly. Uh, and he, he made economics. And I think they, they did learn economics so properly that they managed to transform its, its nature. And I think we have to pay tribute to those two people, Amartya Sen and Ramu Bulhak, who have basically started the great revolution. And this is what I do, and therefore I can stop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Meghnath Desai, that's a wonderful history of how it all began. And now we are jumping to the person who's right on top of what's happening uh, with the Human Development Report. So, Pedro, it's, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Kaushik, for the kind introduction. It's been a pleasure to, to work with you and uh, your guidance. And, uh, advice and uh, I think what I we didn't plan, but w what I'm going to to say I think complements very well uh, what Lord Desai shared because it's about um, uh, sharing with all of you where from the Human Development Report Office we see both the concept uh, and the metrics um, uh, around human development uh, evolving, and, and I should say at the outset that we have a very um, open approach. We, we don't have any sense of, of ownership or, or we are not dogmatic about what our reports say. Uh, this is very much, as I mentioned earlier, a, an ongoing journey. Uh, and it's a space for, for contestation, for critique, and for improvement. So in all that I'm going to share, I, I hope that you will engage in a spirit of um, uh, criticism and also helping us to, uh, uh, to improve uh, what we are currently doing. And I am going to, to speak to the topic of growth and, and human development uh, by engaging with it um, uh, in, um, um, in the following way. I'm going to suggest, um, I don't know if you can see my slides. Uh, they will come up at some point, hopefully. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have a many, uh, many slides, but I, I, I think that it will help me to illustrate some of the work that we're doing, particularly on the research side with, uh, with, some, uh, with some slides. So uh, I say that we are going beyond growth or that human development uh, is inspired by this idea of going beyond uh, GDP. Um, it's not to say that GDP doesn't matter, but it's important to go beyond. So what does that mean, to go beyond uh, GDP? Uh, the way we think about it is that it's important to go beyond GDP by considering three di directions. One uh, is to go beyond income. Uh, and to go beyond income implies looking at the two pillars of human development. One has to do with well-being, another one has to do with agency. So one way of going uh, uh, beyond income is to look at measures of well-being that complement uh, um, uh, GDP. And so the Human Development Index is one of, the, uh, of these measures. As you may be aware, it's an indicator, a composite indicator, that brings together um, uh, GNI per capita, uh, life expectancy at birth, and indicators of achievement in education. 
uh, mean years of schooling and expected years of schooling. Um, it's, uh, it's an indicator in which income enters, uh, I, I don't think this was how, how it was initially conceptualized, but the way in which we speak about it now is uh, income is included in the Human Development Index as an index of capabilities. So achievements in health and education are capabilities in themselves because they are outcomes uh, that are important uh, in themselves. And they, they matter not because they make people better factors of production, which is the human capital narrative. Improving human capital means that these people will then be better factors of production. Of course, that's good, but that's not the point. From a human development perspective, education and health matter intrinsically. So why, what is income doing there? If you care about capability, if you care about outcomes, why, why do you include income? Income is included as a, a, a proxy for other capabilities. Uh, the capability to move, the capability to have a, a shelter, and many others for which income can be considered in itself a proxy or a sub-index of other capabilities that can be acquired in uh, uh, market transactions. It's also, it's also important to note that income is, enters into the index in its current formulation after a logarithmic transformation. What does this mean? It means that as income grows, the uh, ability of uh, income to be a proxy of these basic capabilities is reduced. It, it matters less to the, to the level of the Human Development Index. In fact, its marginal contribution declines at the rate of one over the level of income because the derivative of the <coughs> logarithmic of x is one over x. So it becomes less and less important as countries go richer. And uh, I also want to mention, so this is what the table in uh, table one in a human development report looks like. Sometimes people say, why do you have a composite index? Why don't you have a dashboard? Well, why not having both? And in fact, we have both. So in the first column of table one, you have the Human Development Index, and then in the other columns, you have the aggregate indicators. So if you don't like the Human Development Index, if you don't like Composite Index, if you think that you should look at income separately from life expectancy, it's there. And in fact, Amartya Sen in the 2020 Human Development Report, he told the story, not in the way you did, about how uh, him and uh, Mabubul Haq came, came with the idea uh, of the Human Development Index, and it's very explicit. If you have a chance, you should read this contribution. It's only one page long in the 2020 Human Development Report. And he said their intention was always to use an instrument that would enable people to look at the other tables and at the other uh, columns. It was not to just impose one metric uh, in a dogmatic way and saying this is the definitive measure was an invitation for people to get intrigued and understand why, why is this country ranked above? What's driving it? And so I think it's important to bear this in mind that uh, in, in, in the, all the work we do, we try not only to present these composite indices, but always we present all the indicators that go into them because that's part of the uh, exercise around human development is not only to look at, at the aggregate, but also to look at the components. Uh, now, in the multidimensional poverty index that we uh, work on with, um, with Sabina, income is not a part of it because we try to um, be more explicit about uh, these outcomes of standards of living, and we try to specify some of these outcomes that matter. Um, so it's, a, it's another way of uh, having a measure of well-being, if you want, that goes, that goes beyond income. So just to situate you, I said that it's important to go beyond GDP in three directions. One is going beyond income, and I gave examples about how we're doing that with Human Development Index, with the Multidimensional Poverty Index. <laughs> as uh, ways of going beyond income by having measures of well-being that are broader than uh, uh, just relying on, on GDP. But human development is not only about well-being, it's about agency. So on agency, I must say that uh, we 
uh, are still working, trying to find ways of uh, having indicators that capture agency. But one, one of the dimensions in which the discrepancy between well-being and agency is very clear, and it has been documented in the literature for many years, is when it comes to gender equalities, where you often see that when gaps in well-being between uh, genders narrow, that does not mean that gaps in agency narrow. Uh, narrow. So often they stay uh, very wide and can even, can even increase. So from the very beginning, uh, we, um, or the Human Development Report Office, introduced metrics of gender inequality that try to account for this discrepancy in agency. Currently, the measure that does this is the Gender Inequality Index, and more recently, we've also tried to introduce new measures associated with social norms that uh, impede uh, uh, gender, gender equality. So, as I say this, you can, al you can already see that human development is not human development index. Sometimes I fear that the concept of human development is a little bit hostage, given the success of the human development index. But it's broader than that. And when index alone does not capture the richness of the concept. So, going beyond the income, we have metrics that try to uh, 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 have broader indicators of well-being, metrics that somehow try to account for, for agency. So this is the first direction of travel, going beyond uh, income. The second direction in which it's important to go beyond is to go beyond averages. So Amartya Sen's famous uh, welfare uh, function, he proposed a welfare function in which income was adjusted by one minus genius, as, as Kaushik me uh, mentioned. So we did that, in fact, with the introduction of something that we call the Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index, in which we deflate the level of the Human Development Index by the level of inequality, not only in income, but in the other two components of uh, the, um, uh, the Human Development Index as well. And the findings are striking. Uh, at, uh, in some countries, the reduction, the decline in the Human Development Index is 25%, sometimes 30%, once you take account of the inequalities across the population with this adjustment with, human uh, with the inequality adjusted HDI. But inequalities matter not only across people, they matter also across groups. I already spoke about gender inequalities, which have been a concern of human development for a long time, at least since the 1995 Human Development Report that introduced, actually, new indices of gender, gender inequality. Uh, but now I'm going to, to tell you a little bit of some of the work that is more at the cutting edge on this idea of going beyond averages that looks at the disaggregating the Human Development Index across the territory. Because often uh, inequalities have a territorial expression, a territorial signal. Um, and so last year, there was a, a paper that I don't know if any of you saw, but it was published in Nature, that uh, computed the Human Development Index at the level of census tracts for the United States. It is a group of colleagues at the University of Chicago, and they called it the Community HDI. If you just Google US Community HDI, there's actually an interactive website in which you can see the dispersion of the Human Development Index. So um, it's coded by color, uh, lighter colors, or colors that turn to the yellow um, uh, or orange may mean higher levels of the Human Development Index, to the purple mean uh, lower levels of the Human Development Index. Uh, so you see some results uh, on the slide on the lower, uh, uh, lower uh, right-hand side. Um, but one of the striking findings of this paper is that the Human Development Index is associated, is correlated with 17 indicators of social disadvantage. This is an empirical result. It's not driven by theory, but it's striking. That, you know, something as simple that Amartya Sen, Mabubul Haq, Lord Desai come up with does such a good job at predicting social disadvantage across many dimensions. And so I ask you, I, I throw out the challenge to you, there are all these indices out there 
of progress, right? As the social progress index, as you know, the list goes on. Try to make a correlation between those indices that have sometimes dozens of, of indicators with the Human Development Index. In most cases, you'll see correlations that are similar to this. This is an empirical result. It's, I, don't, I don't know why, I don't know what's the theory, but it's just, in a sense, validation, I guess, empirical validation of the power of this simple index to uh, do such a good job at predicting social disadvantage. And I will add that uh, there sometimes there was a criticism by Martin Ravallion that um, these are mashup indices. You know, we just put together things ad hoc, arbitrarily. I don't think that's the case uh, uh, in, in all of our metrics. They are informed by this human development approach, this capabilities approach. Same applies to the multidimensional poverty index. You can disagree with the approach, you can challenge it, but you cannot say that they are not grounded in some theory, in, in some framework. And I think that sets uh, 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 these indices apart. Okay, this is for the United States. The United States is a, a country in which there is very good data. So what do we do for the rest of the world? So this is the experimental work that I wanted to tell you about uh, that we're doing in our office in collaboration with, um, with uh, colleagues in many universities. So currently we have the Human Development Index, as you see on the first row uh, on this slide, computed for uh, over 190 countries. So the unit of analysis is the um, uh, country. We are able to go down at more granular level and currently we are able to estimate, these are estimates or predictions of the Human Development Index in essentially um, squares uh, of 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, which is what, is what you see on the, on the bottom uh, row here. So how do we do this? We do this by training uh, an artificial intelligence algorithm using uh, satellite images. So this is not real actual data, these are predictions but they enable us to paint a picture uh, of the disparities uh, in the Human Development Index uh, across, across the territory. So the, the, the colors are the same towards the purple lower levels of the HDI, towards the yellow-orange uh, higher levels uh, of the HDI. I, I wanted to uh, make a parenthesis here to tell you another uh, thing that, that we are interested in. So I mentioned this idea, I'm here now again to situate you on this direction of going beyond averages, looking at inequalities. So all that I've said before is premised on the idea that policymakers and the public react to these numbers and use these numbers. And of course, this is true and that's why we continue to publish it. But more and more, um, and uh, Chico Freire yesterday mentioned it, I don't know if, if you heard this lecture, uh, that we have evidence that, um, of, of two things. First of all, that preferences for inequality vary across the population and across countries. So what you see on this slide uh, is the result of um, people expressing different preferences in different countries uh, on inequality. And there are three categories here. One are egalitarians, people that believe that no inequality is acceptable. Um, libertarians, people that say all inequalities are acceptable. And then uh, in the paper, this is work by Ingvil Dalmas, uh, she calls it uh, meri meritocratic. So these are people that say that inequalities that are not attributed to individual responsibility are not acceptable. And um, you would expect that this meritocratic idea is, is one that, that is pervasive. It's the foundation for many nor form, uh, um, 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 uh, normative theories. Uh, of, of income distribution, but you can see how it varies uh, a, a, a across countries. Um, so um, I think that we, I don't know exactly what to do with this information, but we have to be mindful that people, different countries have different preferences on inequality. And the second thing is that there is diversity also in terms of the beliefs that people have about whether inequality is fair or unfair. In fact, we have evidence that there is very little correlation between actual levels of income inequality and support for income redistribution. 
but there is a very high correlation between people that perceive inequality as being unfair and supporting redistribution. So this is, this is association is correlational, it's not, it's not causal, so I, I don't want to make big claims out of this, but it just shows that in, in, additional, in addition to providing information, I think we need to understand better the processes through which people uh, absorb and come, uh, come to form beliefs. So this is another area of research that we are currently pursuing. So I'll conclude with the, uh, I think I'm, I hope I'm doing well on yeah, time. Yeah, no, three, four minutes. Three, four minutes, so I think that's, that's enough. So beyond income, beyond averages, and what is the three beyond? Beyond today. What does beyond today mean? If you think of, of GDP or income, this is something that we cannot leave to future generations. It's a flow. So what can we leave to future generations? Assets, capital. That's what we can leave to future generations, including, if you want to use that expression, natural capital. So we are trying to understand uh, how to engage with the theoretical and empirical work that is currently being undertaken on measuring wealth and see if there's a way of connecting um, uh, the measurement of wealth uh, and the theory of wealth uh, with, uh, with metrics of human development. So I don't have anything to report, but I just want to, to tell you that this is some, some work that we're currently on doing because it's, it's essential to discussions around sustainability. What do we leave to the future? Uh, uh, because the current metrics that we have do not do a good job at doing that. But we are doing something different that uh, supplements or complements this idea of looking about what are the prospects for human development into the, into the future. So earlier I mentioned this idea of the Anthropocene, climate change, biodiversity loss. So one of the things we are, we are doing is um, uh, trying to essentially address the question of how are the prospects for human development going to be shaped in a context of climate change. And we're doing that with a, a platform that is available. You see the URL here. If you just uh, uh, click uh, Human Climate Horizons is what we call it. Uh, um, uh, and the idea is to see how climate change is going to um, determine uh, variables, not, not the metrics that we have directly, not the HDI necessarily, but m the metrics that are relevant for human development or indicators that are re relevant for human development. So on this slide, you see the implications of sea level rise for India from now until the end of the century in a scenario of high emissions, very high emissions. And in this platform, you can choose the time horizon, you can, you can choose an horizon until the middle of the century, and you can choose the emission scenario. We have data also for mortality. And you can see on the chart that uh, the information that we provide is not only aggregated at the country level, because we know that the uh, manifestations of the impacts of climate change across the territory, particularly large countries like India, are going to be very di diverse. So this is uh, an estimate of how much mortality is likely to increase from now until the end of the century. We have indicators of the implications for labor supply, the ability of people to work. And here I, I show you the figure of, of, of two, of two um, uh, scenarios, one with high emissions, another one with moderate emissions, uh, greenhouse houses emissions. Because I think the value of this tool it lies not only in uh, providing information about human development impacts uh, uh, of climate change into the future, but also in um, giving uh, salience to the importance of choice in determining how these outcomes are going to happen or whether they are going to happen or not. So you see that in a high emission scenario, the number of uh, 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 days of work that are going to be reduced in the case of India is much higher than in the moderate emission scenario. So I think it's important to again go back to this notion of agency uh, um, uh, in, in, in the, the information that, that we provide, that there's still a choice out there. It's not inevitable that the outcomes are going to be as bad as in a high emissions uh, scenario. 
So um, this is, this is uh, how I would like to conclude. I, I, I know there's a lot of information, so I'll, let me just try to, to recap very briefly. Um, one way of thinking about the relationship between growth and human development is uh, going back to the origins of, of the Human Development Index and the Human Development Concept, that it's important to go beyond income, beyond averages, and beyond today. So this defines a broad agenda um, that we are trying to pursue, but it's much bigger than what we can do on our own. So I invite all of you to also engage in it, contribute uh, to our work, but also to pursue it uh, yourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro. You know, listening to both the previous speakers, my mind was drifting back to the early days of this work. Very often, one important problem you face with a measure that has many different dimensions is whether to pull it all in into one number or to leave it, as which was briefly touched on, as a vector of indicators. And I know one particular indicator, very controversial, that I, I had worked with closely, ease of doing business. <laughs> ten different measures. Do you leave them as ten different measures? That interesting thing is there's a strategic element in this. Countries, as was pointed out by Meghnath earlier, love the fact that they have to compete on this ranking. As soon as you leave it as multidimensional without giving a ranking, we've been talking about Amartya Sen's work, it goes back to the notion of a quasi-order because you may not be able to rank all countries. One country is better on one dimension, worse on another. So some of the impact that I want to rise on the ranking is dampened by leaving it as a vector. So there are big questions. Do you leave it as a vector or pull it in when there is a unique ranking and countries strive to go up? But now we have a speaker who is really quite a master of multidimensional measures. Sabina al the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Koshik. And it's, it's both lovely and daunting to be here um, with, as he mentioned, my doctoral external uh, assessor. And so I do very much feel like a student, um, and that's unusual. Um, but uh, one feature of a student is that you are supposed to answer the question. So in the presentation, I, I attempted briefly to answer the question, what is the link between growth and human development as reflected in a multidimensional poverty index that we do jointly with Pedro Consensao and the HDRO and UNDP. But then I move on because you can also wrestle with the question. And so similarly to Pedro, uh, move on to look at uh, different aspects of growth and going beyond um, some of the current uh, work. So um, in what I will share, I will be really exclusively focusing on our joint global multidimensional poverty index. And so just a very brief recap, although I think it's familiar. Uh, you are looking at 10 indicators, and you're looking at who lives in a household where somebody is undernourished, or very sadly, where a child has died, who lives in a household where nobody has completed six years of schooling, or a child is not attending school up to class eight, who lives in a, child, uh, a household where they cook with solid cooking fuel, they lack adequate sanitation, a co covered pit latrine, for example, lack access to drinking water that is within a 30-minute walk and that is safe, um, lack access to electricity, their housing is not improved or it is natural or rudimentary, and they don't have more than one of a set of small assets, radio, television, telephone, uh, bicycle, motorcycle, animal cart, computer, refrigerator. And if they have a car or truck, they're not deprived in assets. And so for each person in the data set that you are using, you are going to look across. You're not going to add up like the HDI first. You're going to look across in the rooms, different rooms of a person's life, and see which of these experiences are happening at the same time. Is somebody deprived and there's a lack of electricity? And you weight them and you add them up to obtain a deprivation score for each person. And I'm going into this because we're going to come back to it. 
Um, the MPI then identifies people as poor in the case of the global MPI if they are deprived in one third or more of the indicators, and then computes a measure um, which adjusts the headcount ratio, the percentage of the population who are poor, by the average intensity, the average deprivation score, how bad on average the poverty is, how many overlapping deprivations people face. And that has some axiomatic properties. Now, in terms of trying to answer the question, um, if you look at economic growth and multidimensional poverty across the states of India from 2005-06 to 2015-16, first, you have to choose what definition of reduction of poverty you will look at. This graphic is absolute. So it's looking at, in a sense, a comparable measure of deprivations and people who come out of poverty. It's asking how many of the deprived deprivations of poor people are changing in this decade. And economic growth is on the horizontal axis. And if there were a, re a relationship, then the regression line that you see plotted, both population weighted and not, would be going up. Sorry, would be going down, um, would be downward sloping. But you see the opposite. So you see at a glance, if we are trying to answer the question of what has been the relationship between economic growth and reduction of multidimensional poverty in absolute terms across the states of India, you don't have a, a significant relationship. There is, if you look at relative change in MPI. What is relative change? Let's take two examples, Tamil Nadu and Odisha. If Tamil Nadu, whose headcount ratio is 3.8%, cut its poverty by half in relative terms, it would reduce it to half of 3.8, which is 1.9. It would have a change of 1.9% of the people living in Tamil Nadu. Now, let's say that Odisha reduced its poverty in a relative term by one quarter, so half of the reduction of Tamil Nadu. In Odisha, 20.8% of people are poor, so one quarter of that is 5.2% of the population of Odisha. So in absolute terms, Odisha would reduce by 52 and Tamil Nadu by 1.8. But in relative terms, Tamil Nadu would win the day. So the definitions that we use when we think of growth matter a great deal. In a paper with Shoman Shet, uh, published in 2021, we also look not only at regression growth elasticities, but measured elasticities and semi-elasticities. And the story of that paper, and the reason I can't take 15 minutes for it, is that it really depends which measure you use what the results are. But also, probably that may not be the most important question, because probably, following Bourguignon, Klassen, uh, many authors, uh, the 2008 paper, the relationship between economic growth and non-monetary poverty indicators is much more complex going through social policy, going through institutions. So I'm going to change the question. What if we don't ask about economic growth but what if we ask about the shape of the growth of the 10 indicators that I mentioned that comprise the MPI, but look at it across the society of India, not focusing on the 16.4% of people who are poor by the global MPI? For those of you who will know this, you will recognize that um, sharing the panel with Norbert and Koshik, this mirrors the World Bank's growth of the bottom 40% indicator that Koshik championed. And I confess that um, in Tanzania, in the back of a vehicle, Koshik was saying that we should look at this question for MPI. So this is for you. So um, there is a question of how a distribution changes um, of income in the case of economic growth, but also perhaps in this package of 10 deprivations that a multidimensional poverty index um, uses. Um, and so there are some technicalities because income can grow into the billions, but uh, multidimensional measures are bounded 
including life expectancy or the school indicators of the HDI and many of the indicators of the MPI. And also, um, they are represented in a poverty measure by simply do you have a standard or not. And so there are some technicalities in trying to look at um, the changes. And so this second study takes a very basic approach um, to look at uh, the growth of the bottom 40% of all of the deprivation scores of a society across the 10 indicators of the MPI. So all you look at is the deprivation profiles. So if I'm deprived in all 10 indicators, my deprivation score is 100%. If I'm not deprived in any, it's 50%. Uh, sorry, 0%. If I'm deprived in schooling, nutrition, and a child is out of school, then it's 50%. So every person in the data set is ranked, and you have a vector of deprivation scores from 0 to 100%, or whatever the national boundaries are. So you don't identify anymore. You look at the evolution of that vector of scores. Are you with me? One-tenth nods. <laughs> um, so just very simply, um, you can divide the society for simplicity instead of looking at everybody, look at two population groups or five population groups. And if you want, you can say the bottom group are, they weigh more. So you can have a general framework, more general than the bottom 40%. But the basic idea is that if everybody grows, if everybody's improvements in their deprivations are the same across the entire society, then there's no uh, focus on the less well-off. And so what you'd rather is that the less well-off grow faster, respecting the bounds. So to be very simple, this is the uh, example for India 20, 20, 2005 six to 2015. If we divide the society into five quintiles, and then the average growth in MPI was um, 0 0.019 MPI units, so we multiply it 1.99, 1.39 MPI units. But what you see is that the poorest sections of that distribution grow faster, um, and the less poor grow less fast. Uh, and so if you look at the growth of the bottom two quintiles and take their average, then you add them up and divide by two, very simple, and the poorest quintiles grew at 1.87 which is faster than the national growth. So there's a kind of inclusion. Um, and we can do this, of course, using a bigger um, weight on the bottom quintiles, which is what the paper does, weighting the, the poorest quintile five, the next poorest three, the next poorest one, and the richest quintiles, the richest 40% don't matter. Um, and then we study the results over 75 countries over time and look at how many of them had growth that was inclusive and look at robustness tests, which is our, our nature. Um, and what you see is that uh, while 71 countries had overall growth um, of the areas of these deprivations or overall reduction of deprivations, considering standard errors, um, only three quarters of them had an inclusivity premium where the bottom quintiles grew faster. And if we compare this with the World Bank's shared prosperity measure for the 25 countries where we have reasonably comparable data, um, there's no monotonic relationship. So these are measuring different things. The World Bank's relative um, growth of the bottom 40% and multidimensional poverty have different patterns. So this calls for further analysis. But also this draws attention to some uh, aspects of change that even reductions in multidimensional poverty index globally overlook. And so I think that this conversation um, could be uh, one to continue to probe further. But just like Koshik did, uh, it would be good to go beyond some of the elements of uh, the traditional focuses simply on changes of poverty. Already, in the case of multidimensional poverty, as, as you know, it is extensively disaggregated. And this is measured. This is not interpolated. This is not estimated. This is not modeled. But this is with data. 
the global MPI for 1,281 subnational regions. Um, and, but what we are looking at in some steps going forward is using panel data, trying to see where reductions of poverty lost, not for the country, but for the individual people who were poor and came out of poverty. A second area is gender. And a third area is environmental deprivations that strike the people at the same moment in time. So my last three slides are simply one each on these topics to showcase a work that is either published or ongoing, but that might be interesting because it's linking um, multidimensional poverty with other aspects of human development that seem quite central. The first is sustainability not of the environment, and not at a country level, but at the level of the individual person or household. If I leave poverty, it's good, but if next year I fall back, or if I jump in and out, which is called churning, um, it's less good. And of course, we do not have data which tracks individual people over time, panel or longitudinal data, for um, many of the uh, critical mass of global countries. But this, these data are the EU silk data from Europe. This is work joint with Anne Catherine Guillo and Maurizio Abablaza. And it's looking at longitudinal data um, for one period, 2014 to 17. We have other periods as well. And looking at the um, reductions of poverty uh, over that time period. And we divide the entire uh, poor population and populations into the group um, that were always poor, which is the bottom yellow stripe, the group that moved into or out of poverty. So blue is into poverty and orange above it is out of poverty. And the group that were chronically poor, poor over all of the periods. And we add these up. And what you see is that um, up to 25% of Europeans were poor at least once during a three-year period when you look at all of the volatility. And that's using the EU 2020 measure, not a multidimensional poverty index, which has income, the, a relative income poverty. It has quasi-joblessness. And it has an index of material deprivation, which is basically an asset index, including shoes and vacation, the ability to eat protein twice a week, um, uh, housing conditions, uh, pollution, et cetera, 12 indicators. So if we augment this with the health, the education, some living standard indicators for an MPI, the volatility comes quite down. And so I think it would be interesting to also look at stable um, success in poverty reduction at the individual level and use panel data to explore this further. The next, and I cannot touch on this deeply enough, this is what mostly our group are working on this year, is gender. But a couple years ago with HDRO, we did one finding, which is we asked how many of the people that were poor that year across the 5.9 billion people studied um, did not have any girl or woman in the household who had completed six years of schooling. And everybody had to have a, an eligible household, a female in their household. And we found that two thirds of the people globally who were poor did not have an educated girl or woman. Um, and 215 million people lived in households where the male was educated, but no female was. So there was intra-household inequalities. Um, this work is now being expanded to look at gendered intra-household patterns of child nutrition, child school attendance, and of the first generation learners, that is children who live in a household where no adult has completed six years of schooling, but a child has. So they're the first in their household, pioneer children. And looking at each group by gender, by poverty status, um, and by transitions over time, as well as across dimensions, how many of the poor undernourished children live in households without an educated woman. So this is measured, not regression-based, not modeled, and this is forthcoming. Finally, again, a very large topic um, is the overlay between poverty and lived environmental conditions. 
And there are many ways of looking at this. One is to look at planetary boundaries, the health of the planet and the health of the people. The other way, and we're pursuing both, this, this example is about looking at people who are poor and looking at environmental impacts in that same period, in the same year, cyclones, wildfires, forest loss, air pollution, precipitate quality, uh, earthquakes, and seeing whether who was struck by these natural events. And did, does it augment poverty in terms of if we look at the overlaps between these environmental human striking threats and multidimensional poverty? So this requires geospatial merging of satellite data um, with the PSU or the household locations and looking at those over time and their teething problems because the human representative sample is not climactically representative, et cetera. But this is work um, going on at a case study level that we hope to take to a global level, maybe for 2025. So um, again, this is uh, just an attempt as a person feeling very much like a student um, here in the presence of Professor Desai uh, to look at the question of growth and human development, growth and poverty reduction and their associations, but then to wrestle with the question, to look at growth of the bottom 40%, not of poverty, but of the entire distribution of people who are deprived um, in India or globally, and then to focus on some areas of extension that I think are interesting. And perhaps if there are people looking for theses, looking for research topics, um, these are areas that need many minds, many hearts um, to drive the work forward in ways that are genuinely useful. So thank you so much. Sabina, thank you very much. I'm actually personally the last bit on the bottom 40% was of some direct interest to me. I may add here that when I was at the World Bank, one little bit of UNDP kind of thought that I managed to carry <laughs> into the World Bank is what Sabina just it referred to, house. arguing that you know we compete in rankings. If we could make the world focus on <laughs> the bottom 40% of every country, and then you treat the country's success as how the bottom 40% has done, that was the idea, which was extremely difficult to push it in. I did refer to two great thinkers who were behind that kind of an idea, John Rawls and Mahatma Gandhi, that you focus on the poorest and the weakest and you evaluate a state about how they are doing. But, We've already touched on the politics of these things can get very hard. It took, it was an interminable process making the World Bank collect data on the bottom 40% and displaying because the big concern was that some of the big and powerful countries will immediately drop rank if you're looking at their bottom 40%. And the biggest concern was United States. And it took months. I had meetings with the Treasury, Secretary of Treasury, trying to persuade. And what did work, I have to say, in the end was the reminder that the US will drop rank. As soon as you look at bottom 40%, many European countries will cross over. But I made the case that, look, US has many things to be proud of. And one more thing to be proud of is if it could be open about its weaknesses, that let that be shown on display that this is where you need to do something. We got our way. Needless to point out that Donald Trump was not yet president. So it happened. And I'm very good to now see the space between multidimensionality and the bottom segment of the population. Well, that allows us to seg segue a little bit into the kind of work taking place in the World Bank and to Dr. Norman Shadi. The floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether it'll come up or not. I feel like I'm losing my voice uh, now as well. Uh, so Kaushik, your influence, which has been positive in many ways, might be um, n negative in, in this particular uh, case. Um, but uh, I have a few words. I'm not quite sure how to switch this to full screen mode. And this seems to be a slightly different interface from the one that I have on my computer. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, 
my, my children make fun of me all the time about being uh, technologically um, very backward, and uh, I'm afraid that they're right on this. They're right on lots of things. I don't like to admit it to them, but they're right on lots of things, and certainly this is, this is one of them. Um, so I have a few slides. I don't have any, I have to say, uh, sadly, I don't have any entertaining anecdotes about uh, the back of some van in Tanzania or some meeting in some office and what happened after that. I just have a few thoughts and, and, and a few uh, graphs, which are maybe a little bit more dry, but hopefully you can bear with me and, uh, and they'll stimulate at least uh, some, some thoughts. Um, so I want to make four main points. The first is that um, human capital, I'm not going to be talking about human capital. I know there's some controversy about whether we should be talking about human development or human capital, but I'm going to be talking about human capital because I'm talking really about the relationship between measures of human something and growth, and the, uh, the most extensive literature on this is actually using uh, measures of human capital. Uh, so human capital is key to understanding productivity differences uh, across countries and the distribution of income within a country. So I'm going to make uh, this going to be the first point. The second is that human capital is multidimensional and is built in a cumulative fashion over the life cycle. The third is that although we tend to focus primarily on the extent to which policy enables services to build human development and human capital. There's a very uh, important role, and I'm going to particularly focus on firms, but there's a very important role for both families and firms. And I'm going to be focusing on firms not because I think they're more important than the other two, but just because it's something that we don't traditionally think about uh, a lot. So I am going to be focusing on that. Uh, and, the, and the fourth point I'm going to make is that there are substantial labor market returns to, to both schooling quality as well as quantity and, and to uh, experience. So let's just get uh, right into it. Um, by one recent estimate, which includes uh, another chief economist of the World Bank and a Nobel Prize uh, winner, Paul uh, Romer, the, about two thirds to three quarters of the difference between uh, the incomes of rich and poor countries can be accounted for by differences in their human capital. So this is a non-trivial uh, amount, for sure. Uh, and, and so it's something that clearly that if we're thinking about uh, development and, and growth, we want, to, we want to think about. It's also obvious that human capital is a critical determinant of income differences across individuals within a country. Uh, and so thus, human capital affects both uh, the average incomes uh, in, in a society as well as the, as the distribution of, of these incomes uh, across different uh, members. And this, as you saw from the citation before, goes really all the way back to Adam Smith. So as much as economists uh, get maligned, uh, very often uh, correctly so, uh, I think this is a concern that's been with us for, for well, uh, well over 200 years, close to 250 years uh, now uh, in economics. So uh, it's also well known by now that human capital, when we talk about human capital, it's multidimensional. It includes both, I think, uh, cognitive skills, such as literacy, numeracy uh, skills, but also socio-emotional skills. There are real returns in, in terms of the labor market to these uh, skills, such as perseverance uh, and the ability to get along with others, as well as an individual's underlying health status. And so I think this is important because very often the kinds of things we say are human capital really aren't human capital. They're proxies for some dimension of human capital. So for example, we talk about years of schooling or we talk about height for age, stunting, health status. So these are all imperfect proxies for this uh, measure uh, that, we, that, we, that we can't measure perfectly, which is actually um, human capital. So I think the most useful way to think about human capital is that it's a latent variable that is then combined with other factors like physical capital to determine the productivity of individuals in the labor market. And at any point in time t, the human capital that an individual has is a function of our human capital in the previous period and the investments made in the current period uh, and the technology that is used to convert these investments into human capital. And we can skip the mathematical notation um, but that's the, the basic logic of it. It's a cumulative process whereby what happens in one period affects what happens in the subsequent periods, and it's also multidimensional, so just looking at one variable is definitely not the, the right way to go uh, as well. And finally, the last point I want to make on this before actually getting into some numbers is uh, uh, how is human capital uh, built? This is a nice citation from Claudia Golden, who, as you know, got the Nobel Prize for Economics uh, last year. And she makes the point that it is really important to think not just about how much human capital there is, 
but where is it built? What are the agents that are helping build this human capital? And she makes the point that it's important to think not just of the investments that happen, but as I said before, uh, whether this, is t t this takes place in school, on the job, or at home. Uh, and in this, uh, uh, I, I want to stress, and this is the segue into what I'm going to say next, which is that not only services, if you want facilities, because we like the alliteration of facilities, families, and firms, the three Fs, but services more broadly. Um, but it's not just services. It's really what happens as well in families and firms. And because I have a limited amount of time, and I, uh, I, I know Dr. Sharma there is going to uh, uh, scowl at me if I spend more time than I'm, than I'm supposed to, and possibly worse than just scowl. So instead, I'm, I'm going to have to focus uh, just for this presentation mainly on firms, again, because I'm trying to sort of knock, out, knock us out of the sort of more traditional way of thinking of how human capital is built and actually think about what happens in the labor market, in particular what happens in job creation and destruction and what role human capital plays there. So let me start by saying that generally this is not very controversial. At the individual level, we think that human capital powerfully affects an individual's ability to earn a decent income, to earn wages. And this is both in terms of the returns, if you like, to schooling, but also the returns to labor market experience. If you go back to the paper I mentioned before, the paper by Paul Romer and others, they argue that about half of the difference in human, in, uh, in, uh, in the income differences, half of the differences in income between uh, uh, developed and developing countries, the part that is explained by human capital, about half of that is things related to schooling, and half of it is things that have to do with on-the-job learning. And I'll show you some uh, evidence that on-the-job learning, very little of it, comparatively speaking, happens in developing countries, and very little happens, in particular, in some developing countries. So we tend to focus a lot on the things that happen before people uh, join the labor market, but at least if you believe the, the estimates in Paul Romer's paper, it is as important how much learning, how much human capital is built at work, and you will see there are huge differences across countries in the extent to which this actually um, happens. So let's get in first into uh, looking at uh, school attainment. So this is a lot of information here, and I'm not going to be able to go through it in as much detail as you, as you might want, but what you have here is data on school attainment. So this is before we get into the labor market. So this is the little piece I have on before we get into the labor market. And we have here data for four, the four biggest developing countries in the world that jointly account for well over half the population of developing countries and half of GDP of developing countries. And we have population pyramids at two points in time, basically in 1980 and then in uh, 2020 or, 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 or thereabouts. The, the one country for which we don't have data for the 2020 is China. So we only have data for China for about 2010. And what it shows is, the way you want to look at this is, it's cut off uh, before age 25, because people have not completed their schooling arguably before they're age 25. So those are the, the, the slices there that are in gray. And after that, what you have is the, the proportion of people in that particular five-year band who have either essentially no schooling, they have less than a primary school, that's the dark blue uh, part of, the, of, of, of each bar. Then you have people who have completed exactly primary, that's yellow. Then who have completed lower secondary, that's uh, uh, this sort of light green, and then upper secondary, which is, which is gray and tertiary. So what you want to look at, when you, when you look at this, you want to, I think, take away two messages, and it's also split so that we have women on the left and men on the right in these population pyramids. This is fairly standard demographic fare, but nevertheless, I think it's, 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 quite, it's quite informative. So let's, let's look first at, uh, at India in, in the 1980s. So the first thing you want to see is that the vast majority of the population of India in, the in 1980 in, had essentially no schooling, less than completed primary. And moreover, if you look at 1983 in India, what you see is that the part, obviously the, the, the curve is symmetric just about in terms of the numbers, but the part uh, of the, the, the left side of the distribution is a lot more dark blue than the right side of the distribution, which means that a lot more women had completed only, had completed less than primary education than had men in, uh, in 1983 in India. And you see, for example, the comparison with a country like China is actually quite informative. 
what you see in China already in the 1980s is that there isn't that much dark blue. I mean, there is a fair amount of dark blue, but a lot less dark blue than there is in the case of, of India. So there's already in 1980, there's a much larger proportion of the, of the population in China that has at least primary education, that's the part in yellow, but also lower secondary, upper secondary, and, and tertiary. So in some sense, in that sense at least, India already starts in this comparison at a disadvantage. China also has a lot of gender inequality, at least in 1980, in the, se in the sense that if you look at the, at the graph, what you'll see is there's also more dark blue to the left of the center in China in 1980 than there is uh, to, to the right. And then you have other countries that don't have uh, gender inequality, for example, Brazil, in no evidence of gender inequality, but a huge proportion of the, of the population also, much like India, that only has uh, incomplete primary or less. And then you look at, I think one thing that is important is how this moves over time. It takes a long time. This is a little bit like, I don't know how many of you have read the, 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 uh, the book of, of the Little Prince, uh, the Saint Exupéry book of the Little Prince. There's, I remember this funny uh, drawing where there's a snake that swallows, I think it's a mouse. And it takes a long time for the mouse to make its way down, right? I mean, it's a long snake and a mouse, it has to make its way down. It's a little bit like that in demography. It takes a long time, even if you make investments now, it takes a long time for all of these investments to show up in terms of what happens to the distribution of skills in the adult labor force. And that's pretty much what you see here. Clearly, India has made uh, great strides, as, as have other countries, but it's still, in some sense, digesting the lack of investment in schooling that happened or didn't happen many decades before. And this is why, even in 2022, you see that in comparison with, for example, uh, China or even Indonesia, the skills levels of the population in India are, are, much, are much lower. So good. I'm glad you can see the graph there and not, because I, can't, I can hardly see anything here. I see white and a few orange dots. And I thought, well, this is not going to be very informative. All they see is, I mean, I can tell you a story about what's there without the graph, but it's, it's useful that you actually have the graph. But I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that actually, even for a given number of years of schooling, there are huge differences in how much learning occurs in school for countries that have the same average years of schooling. And the, the point I will make in the next slide is that actually years of schooling, which is what we traditionally measure, years of schooling in the absence of learning really don't matter very much in terms of either the labor market returns or the economic growth returns uh, to these investments. And you'll see that in, in the next graph. And there's a huge variation. So look just at the, at the uh, graph on the left, which basically says here are four countries that have the same number of years of schooling. So we've got the Philippines, Ecuador, Hungary, and Macau. And on the left-hand side, we've got what's called the harmonized learning outcomes. It's basically all the different tests that countries take, international tests like the PISA, TIMS, and so on but basically harmonized so they're on the same, using the same units with the same scale. And you see vast differences in how much learning happens, even for countries that have the same number of years of schooling. And so the, the, the bank has been uh, working hard to uh, um, uh, socialize, if you want, a different measure. We don't think that years of schooling as such is, is terribly useful on its own, but rather learning adjusted years of schooling. And here, that's what you've got on the, on the right, and you see that basically many countries, even though their population has whatever, nine years of schooling, 10 years of schooling, the effective, the learning adjusted years of schooling are much, much lower because very little learning actually happens in classrooms, and that is at the end what determines labor market outcomes and economic growth. And that's I don't want to go into the details of that, but basically, this is what these graphs show. That if you look at years of schooling without adjusting for learning outcomes, there's essentially no relationship with growth. So we worry a lot about years of schooling, but if people aren't learning very much, it doesn't predict growth uh, hardly at all. On the other hand, if you look at uh, learning outcomes after you've adjusted for years of schooling, there's a very, very strong, robust relationship with economic growth. So in some sense, when we look at all, when we think about all of these different measures of human development and so on, um, one concern that I think is 
we should all ask ourselves is are we measuring the right things or should we, should we be measuring somewhat different things? And certainly, I think in terms of schooling, we should be giving a lot of hard thought to what is actually happening within the classroom. I, I would say the same thing for younger children where we spend a lot of effort measuring uh, nutritional status, which is, I think, appropriate in some sense, but actually the relationship between, say, stunting and uh, wages later on is a lot weaker than the relationship between, say, cognitive and language development at early ages and uh, wages later on, and, and yet uh, virtually no country measures this regularly, and I think that, that that's a real uh, mistake. And so I think in general, we just want to think a little bit carefully about what is it that we measure and what is it that we don't measure, because I do believe that the kinds of things that we measure really do influence policy at the end in much the, the, the way that people were saying before. So it really the, it places a, a lot of, if you want, uh, uh, burden on us to be advocating that we measure the right things and not measure things that maybe are not as important important as some of the other things, especially now that we have more and more data on a lot of these uh, outcomes or should be collecting more and more data. So let me get very quickly to the stuff that I said I was going to talk about, um, which is it isn't just about the human capital that people acquire before they join the labor market, be it years of schooling or be it learning during these years of schooling. As I said before, at least in this paper by Romer et al., uh, as much of the difference in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in incomes between rich and poor countries is accounted for by years of schooling, as is by the returns to, if you want, labor market experience, which is on the job learning. And look at these graphs. Look at this graph on the right. So what you see here is big, big differences in how much wages go up with every year of labor market experience in different countries. With the Philippines, essentially, and this is, for, this is for, the, for the proportion of people, this is only for those who are in wage labor. So this is, doesn't even take account all of those who are not in wage labor. But even for those who are in wage labor, essentially, over 30 years, if you start working in the Philippines and then you work for the next 30 years, your total wages are going to go up by about oh, I don't know, 20%. And in Brazil, it's four times as much. Now, why do people earn higher? This is private sector employees, so not counting the public sector. And for reasons that we can go into in detail, which has to do with selection into work, it doesn't count women in this case. I, I know this might be controversial, but we can have a discussion about why that is. It's just purely an econometric uh, reason. But what this is saying is that as people work, wages in the private sector are a reflection of productivity, largely. People don't get paid more if they don't, if no, if they don't produce more in their, in their jobs uh, over time. So what this is saying is that in Brazil, which is not, I'm not holding up Brazil as the paragon of all things good by any means. If you look at the, at the curve here for developed countries in the US, it's far above uh, that for Brazil. But in Brazil, over time, people get substantially more productive as they work, and as a result, are paid substantially higher wages. In the Philippines, they're not. In Pakistan, they are a bit, but not that much. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in this dimension of human capital, which is in some ways at least the part of human development that is instrumental. And obviously, there are other reasons to be concerned about human development. This is a panel I was told on human, uh, human development and growth, which is why I'm, I'm bringing this up. But there's big, big differences in how much more productive or not people become in different countries as they work. So how is it that people become more productive? It's largely by learning, by doing, and by job uh, training. And as it turns out, and again, this is some, somewhat that, uh, something that not in all audiences is something that, uh, that, that people like to hear, but there's a lot more learning by doing and uh, human capital accumulation in large firms in the formal sector than there is in small firms, leave alone in self-employment. Because when we're talking about self-employment in developing countries, we're not talking about you know, a doctor who has his own private or her own private practice. We're talking about somebody who's selling something on the street. There's very little increase in their wages or in their earnings, in their income, as they become more experienced. And the, the reality is that there's a lot more of that that happens in formal large firms. And this is the point that, uh, of, of this graph. This is just some of the countries we have. We have here. Uh, people who are employed in firms that have 10 or more in, uh, workers, people employed in firms that have less than 10 workers. We have six countries, but we have the same graph for, for uh, a couple dozen other countries. And basically the point here is there is very, there's much less 
of an increase in earnings and an increase Again, with earnings tied st strongly to productivity, when we're talking about the, at least on average, when we're talking about the private sector, um, there's much less of an increase in earnings in small firms than there is in large firms. So a lot of what is happening is a lot of the reason why we don't see a lot of human capital accumulation in the labor market in many countries is because there are a lot of small firms that are highly unproductive and a lot of firms where people themselves uh, don't grow a lot in terms of their own uh, productivity. And the, the last point I want to make about this is, and this is a little bit more of a, perhaps a little bit of a technical point, the, so the, 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 the um, sort of basic framework that labor economists use to think about what happens to wages and what happens to productivity and so on is uh, a regression in which you have uh, wages as a function of uh, a, a schooling and, and experience, and it this is the, the sorry, if you want, technical aside, if you want, it, 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 it assumes that experience and uh, uh, education are what economists would call additive and, and separable. So you can put one in here, the other here, you don't have to worry about the interactions between the two, and that turns out to be, even though it's the workhorse of labor economics, it turns out to be wildly inaccurate. And here's what you have. These are, again, how much do your wages increase as you work more for workers with different amounts of schooling. So just to go back to the equation I showed a second ago, what that equation assumes is that these lines should all be on top of each other, right? So that the returns to, or they should be parallel to each other with the wages being higher for those who have more schooling, but progressing at the same, uh, at the same pace regardless of schooling, and that's clearly not the case. People with low levels of schooling initially, people with low levels of schooling initially, their wages go up a lot less with experience. As they work more, their wages go up a lot less than is the case with people with more schooling. And you see that in every country, uh, more in some, again, here again, I don't, I've been to the Philippines, but I, I, I'm not up uh, lately on, on the most recent data on the Philippines. But with the exception of the Philippines, uh, it, this is clearly the case in, 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 every, in every country. So, what, what this is saying is that sort of as people enter the labor market, the labor market compounds the differences with which they entered the labor market, right? So it's saying people who come into the labor market with more schooling, yes, we know they earn more wages. But it's not just that they earn more wages by a certain proportion, a certain percentage all the time. Their increase in wages is much steeper than those who enter the labor market with, fewer, uh, with, with less schooling. The final point I, I, I'll make, I think I have two, two slides left, is all of this is only, this is saying how much more, if I invest in schooling, how much more do people make, how much, how much higher will their wages become if I invest in schooling of the population? Now this is, of course, the increases in wages only occur if, or increases in earnings or wages or incomes only occur if you actually work. And the reality is that there are big, big differences across different parts of the world in the proportion of people who work, and in particular, in the large, large differences in female labor force participation. Female labor force participation is everywhere lower than that of men. But look in particular at South Asia and look at uh, uh, Middle East and North Africa. So just look at the first two bars, because the other ones are, have to do with wage employment. But just look at the first two bars. In the Middle East and North Africa, 70% of adults, male adults, work, work in the labor market. Only 17% of women work. Now look at South Asia. It's not as alarming as in the case of Middle East and North Africa, but in, as regards to work that, ha that is in the labor market, that has to do you know, the, the way in which, at least traditionally, the ILO and others have defined uh, work, what you find is that in South Asia, 76% of men work, only 20-some percent of women work in the, in the labor market in this way. So what this is saying is, I've just told you a story about how, as you work, First, you earn wages, but second, you also accumulate more human capital. Obviously, that only happens if you work. It doesn't happen if you don't, if you don't work. So this is, the, I, I believe, the last slide. Yep. Um, what I, I guess the point that I've tried to make is that when we think about human development, human capital, particularly when we think about human capital and growth, which is what I was told I, I, I should spend some time talking about, 
we often think almost exclusively about public services. We think, okay, what's going on with education? Is education, uh, is, what proportion of the population gets X number of years of schooling? We don't often think or don't think enough about various dimensions of that, including, for example, as I mentioned, the quality. But in particular, we also don't think about what happens really once people join the labor market. Once they're doing something other than uh, they are at an age in which they are meant to accumulate schooling and, and, uh, and, and so on. And I think it's really important that when we think about what kinds of human capital actually lead to growth and to what extent are there differences across countries in this, we need to think both about dimensions that have to do with investments before you enter the labor market. And here again, I think our scope has traditionally been quite narrow. I've done a lot of work on early childhood development, and so this is something I feel particularly strongly about, where there's very, very, very good evidence of how things that happen before your age five, and not necessarily or primarily things having to do with nutritional status, predict how well you do in life later on, and yet we, we choose to, as a community to ignore these. We choose not to measure it. And similarly, in terms of schooling, we tend to say, how many years of schooling? But as I showed you before, there are huge differences in how much learning occurs while you're in school uh, across countries. And this is really what drives wages and uh, growth levels, not just simply the years of schooling that people acquire. So that's one part. And the other part is we choose largely not to think, or not all, but largely we choose not to think too much about what happens once people start work. And to what extent do they become more productive and therefore do they contribute more to the economy as they are in the labor market? And here again, I think this is something we neglect at our own peril, if you want, because there are very, very big differences across countries that are robustly associated with wages and eventually with growth as well. So thank you very much, um, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. And now for the hardest part over these fascinating lectures to course over the entire uh, span of uh, topics that we've covered, 10 minutes to Dr. Sita Prabhu. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the most daunting task when I was asked to be a discussant. Of course, I was volunteered to do so uh, in typical Alak Sharma style. And here I am trying to look at different presentations on a variety of uh, you know, aspects of the growth human development uh, linkages, particularly looking a lot of the discussion was also on the indices and the measurement aspect. But I do think that important aspects have been highlighted, and I will try to connect them and put them in the context also of the current scenario, which I think is very essential. While all of them spoke about it, I think Lord Meghnath Desai uh, had uh, alerted us to the circumstances that led to the uh, emergence of the human development paradigm. I also remember the North-South dialogues that went on till 1970, from 1970s, 40-odd round, uh, round tables of bipartisan discussion across uh, you know, uh, various stakeholders. And it was in the 1986, if I remember, the Istanbul uh, North-South dialogue that the idea of putting people at the center of development actually emerged. Later on, the UNDP was given the responsibility of preparing the annual report, and where the contributions of uh, Professor Desai and uh, um, Professor Amartya Sen and Mahbubal Haq mattered a great deal. So I think from there, it has, uh, uh, we also had Pedro looking at the dimensions of how the human development paradigm is trying to go beyond income, beyond averages, and beyond today. I think some very important contributions have come in from the HDRO regarding the inequality adjusted human development index, the planetary pressures adjusted human development index, and they're trying to widen the dialogue into many more dimensions of human development while reminding us constantly that human development does not equate the human development index. I think that is one thing that we uh, a takeaway that we have. And I will uh, try to connect these 
And then we had the uh, presentation by Sabina. Of course, we all know about the multi-dimensional poverty index and where she also pointed out about the diversity on the actual levels of uh, inequalities. And she looked at the indicators and the dimensions and the relationship between uh, economic growth and MPI in absolute as well as relative terms. And one interesting takeaway was that whether growth was inclusive, and she came to the, uh, the empirical analysis pointed to the data that uh, inclusive well-being, uh, when she examined some 75 countries, only one third had bottom 40% where the deprivation levels were uh, reduced. And important, another important aspect from the gender perspective, that two third of the poor people globally had no female who was educated. And this number amounts to, I think if I uh, saw your presentation right, it's about 836 million. So it's a huge number that is there. And then we had the very interesting uh, presentation on the human capital aspect by Norbert, where he looked at the uh, not so, uh, uh, it's a uh, dimension that is not very frequently looked at on on-the-job training. I was reminded of Jacob Mincer and the dialogues that were held in the 1960s where it was very much you know, a part of looking at on-the-job training and what it actually did. And I think I'm glad that he brought that dimension and also pointed out that the uh, human capital formation, in fact, takes a very, very long time to build. All of them, in some way or the other, have connected with the capability approach, talking of how the capabilities are built, not built, what the disadvantages are in the capability formation, and how they can be enhanced. Now, this has very uh, deep implications for the current situation. When we are looking at the interconnected and interacting crises, some people call it the poly crisis, or one may quibble on the terminology, but it is true that we have crisis in the economy, employment, and environment, the three E's at least, if not more. And the value of the HDI had declined for the very first time since 1990, due, and we have halting or even reversing of progress on SDGs. So in this context, when there is huge uncertainty due to the Anthropocene that I think Pedro had also referred to, and there is also complexity of uh, policy making and the complexity of the economy itself, where one policy instrument will not be able to tackle the problems that we have. So, and moreover, the countries which are developing do not have the capacity, institutional capacity, to tackle this complexity. So in such a situation, the policy recommendations that have been given out may be much more difficult to implement, to forge the link between economic growth and human development to a greater extent. One other aspect that has been highlighted is the link between the individual and the collective capabilities. I think while some measures are at the individual level, I think it is important to look at the collective capabilities and how they can be formed or not formed in many instances, and how do we take that forward. Uh, we also, there was some mention of the on-the-job training. So we are talking in terms of advanced capabilities as well. You we are not talking only of basic capabilities. You are talking of advanced capabilities. And in the current context with rapid technological change, I think advanced capability enhancement and the inequalities in advanced capability enhancement will hold the key to the uh, link between economic growth and human development. I would just like to say that uh, Professor uh, Lord Desai mentioned about the 1980s. I think in many senses, to me at least, it seems that there is some reflection of that situation once again right now, because we do have a huge debt crisis. And according to the UN Desai report uh, that was released just last week in 2024, 
It says that the debt to GDP ratio of countries is as high as 92.6%, and in LDCs over 60%. It is over nine percentage points higher than the pre-pandemic debt levels. High and growing debt service burdens are limiting the ability to finance SDGs and therefore human development. So this uh, concern where 36 developing countries are living in countries with extreme poverty and are plagued by severe debt problems and high borrowing costs, how is it that we are going to forge the links between economic growth and human development becomes a very real question that we need to tackle for the, uh, at the current period. I also find that the link between economic growth and human development has weakened over the years with inequality rising in many countries. That is what we had discussed yesterday. And the uh, focus on inequality adjusted human development index, I think is much more relevant today than at any other time earlier. Because I think the inequality adjusted human development index pointed out that in many countries, the value of the HDI gets reduced by as much as 25% if you were to take the distribution of capabilities uh, across dimensions into account. And more so, I would also like to point out, in some of the countries, the inequality in education, because we had discussed so much on education, the loss in the education index due to inequality, in India, for example, it's around 36, 38%. As compared to income, it's about 16 to 18%, depending on the year in which you look at. So twice the level of loss of the education index shows that it can potentially, education we always think of basic and secondary education, we do not look at it as a redistributive measure. Having lost out on all other redistributive measures, it may be time for us to position the acquisition of secondary education, more so after all the human capital discussion that we have had and yesterday's discussions of positioning secondary universal compulsory good quality secondary education as a redistribution measure to forge the link between economic growth and human development to a much greater extent than ever before. I also uh, want to say that the Planetary Adjusted Human Development Index does bring in another dimension where the rise in Human Development Index alone is not sufficient because most of the HDI countries also suffer a great loss when adjusted for planetary pressures, the CO2 emissions and the carbon footprint that they leave behind and the material footprint. So I do think that it is necessary for us to look at the economic growth, the per capita income, and the PHDI, the planetary adjusted HDI much more closely, as also the uh, per capita income and the IHDI. And what is the relationship between the income adjusted human development index, the planetary adjusted human development index, and per capita income growth is something that would require greater uh, analysis, understanding, and that I think is an area that we would want to look at. One more thing, that when countries go to international you know, development by, uh, banks or the IMF or other institutions, there is a fiscal consolidation that is recommended. We have seen in the 1980s how the fiscal consolidation had led to reduction in the uh, social sector expenditures. I have written extensively on this at that time and how for the sub-Saharan African countries, it was an era of a lost decade. Now, my fear is there are many more countries which are in the debt uh, crisis spread across the world. How do we, and the recommendations are the same, almost 85 countries which had uh, approached the IMF post-COVID, most of the countries have undertaken to implement fiscal consolidation, which means that real wage cuts, and there would be uh, some compression of expenditures at a time when they actually need to step up the support to the poor and the vulnerable, more so because uh, you find that the impact of COVID, as was mentioned, is long lasting and it is not going away as yet. And the impact of reduction in schooling that was so dramatically brought out are going to last 
many, many more years and may influence lifetime earnings. If you want to preserve the capabilities of individuals, the time to act was yesterday, not even today. So I think there is an urgency about preserving the capabilities of people beyond you know, what we are doing right now to ensure that we do take care and invest in people. Now, one, one more thing. I just want to point out the curiosity of it. If you've been around for as long as I have, you'll see that in 1990, uh, the, the poor, country, poor people lived in poor countries. By 2010, you find that the poor people, six out of 10, are now in middle-income countries. That, without any indices, without any uh, further analytical tools, it tells you a lot about the relationship between economic growth and human development. If middle-income countries contain the bulk of the poor, what is the type of growth, economic growth, that we are looking at? And Professor Deepak Nair had very dramatically uh, highlighted in his book on catch-up that the people between the extreme poverty and the poverty line is a huge, huge number. And I think that is something that that we really need to remember that really the number of people, about a large number, I think it's about 800 million or so, who are between the extreme poverty and uh, the uh, poverty level, whichever uh, benchmark that you take, which means that people can slip back into poverty, a point that was mentioned here as well. So I think it is very fragile as of now the relationship between economic growth and human development. And I think it is time for us to remember two things without taking too much time. I think it's appropriate to remember Mehbo Bulhak, whose clarion call was to stand economic theory on its head. I think we need to look at the type of growth that we advocate for, the relationship between the enhancement in the per capita income and the distributional aspects and whether it enhances the capabilities. Basic, basic capabilities will no longer do. It will have to be advanced capabilities if you want people to move up and take up the jobs that are being offered in the more advanced sectors. And I think it's also time to remember about values. I think that was something that was mentioned uh, briefly. I think the values and maybe it's time to remember that economics started its journey as a branch of ethics. And then it went away on its own with ethical values being confined to welfare economics, one branch. And the rest of economics were as if unshackled by the concern for ethical values. I think unless there is a, a reversal of this, and we bring in equity and sustainability as the core of the values that we pursue in development, it is not possible, really, to reverse the policies or to follow them consistently across the range. Normally, we have poverty alleviation policies, while other types of policies that the government follows aggravates poverty in many instances. So I think we need, if you want consistency and synergy across policies, we will have to take into account, the, and there has to be a new social contract maybe. How this comes about is something that we will not look at. But where we place equity and sustainability at the core of development, I think there should be a consensus on it. I will end with just two points. That one, in the decades to come, in the years to come, when there is uncertainty, when there is climate change due to the Anthropocene, rapid pace of uh, changes, extreme shocks that the countries will uh, witness uh, willy-nilly, whether they like it or not, and where the poor and vulnerable will be affected to a much greater extent, human development is really in danger. And here we need to look at four R's, as I call them, recovery, resilience, responsiveness, and responsibility. Recovery, not merely of the economy, but of the people, just recovery. Resilience, not merely of economy, but of the people. Responsiveness of the governments and the private sector towards the plight of the people. 
and responsibility, where there is also individuals who take responsibility, as well as communities, along with the government and private sector, which is what the lifestyle for environment uh, concept is all about that was proposed in the G20. And for this, I think the four Cs are crucial. And what are these four Cs? Mm -hmm. I would talk of capabilities, community, culture, and choices, which need to be emphasized. I think this, with this uh, four, where capabilities are placed center stage, people are placed center stage, and concern more about people rather than economy, and our recovery, resilience, responsiveness, and responsibility with capability, community, the cultural values, and the choices that need to be enlarged, need to be looked at for us to forge better links between economic growth and human development in the years to come. Thank you. Okay, I was, so five minutes, so, okay, so uh, we can, I had said we'll have some time for discussion, but it's very limited. Five minutes, so let me just pick up maybe three questions to start with. Start with is wrong, three questions. I've got three hands straight away, Bina back there and here, Bina. Yeah, you, or you can get up and try to speak loud. I don't think we'll get there. Yeah, and here. You can come up here. It's OK, Bina, come. You can come up here, but don't, yeah, don't use the investment to make the question longer. So you just do, it, it doesn't work. But I think you're quite audible. I'm very loud. I think most people really understand. OK. You have to switch it on, maybe. Thank you for an excellent panel. Um, two quick questions. One is, uh, Sabina, you know, in the multidimensional poverty, uh, to what extent do you, you don't seem to build in productive assets? So your assets tend to be much more in the terms of consumer goods and so on. And is that something that you've thought about? And this becomes especially important when you're looking at gender equity, which is what you're going to move towards, that beyond education, it seems to me that does a woman, is there any woman who owning any productive assets? The second is very quick. Um, in 2008, um, uh, the French president set up the Commission for the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress. We had 24 people, two women, Nancy Fulbright and myself, and five Nobel laureates. So we came up with a long dashboard. We didn't go for an index, but we distinguished between current uh, indicators of well-being and sustainable, sustainability. Now, much of it was standard stuff that you would know, but there were two elements which were important. We went a lot of detail into issues of environmental indicators. And then in the current well-being, we also talked about subjective indicators, happiness, because Daniel Kahneman, after all, was a member of the committee. So to what extent have any of this, this was 2008, been something that UNDP uh, and HDI have reflected on? Um, and the complexity of measuring uh, environmental questions, which you're going to do, it seems to me makes it very difficult to put them all together in a single index. Thank you very much. Uh, one question here, and then I'll come to you at the back. Uh, yeah. I'm N.K. Chaudhary from Patna. How is it that ideological questions are ignored? Because, in my opinion, that determines the role of the state and the market. And it has a huge impact on human development. It seems that in this country, and more so in the developing states like Bihar and UP, we have handed over education and public health to market forces. And it has a huge impact on at least the quality of education 
and health care in these states. Secondly, even in income generation, what is important is what is our central goal. Is employment taken to be the byproduct of growth or growth byproduct of education? Because this question does have an impact on the health care and education of the poor people, and even the equality of income question. Uh, employment, which is now being discussed in this country, every party is discussing, who is th this going to be the central objective of the whole process of development, or as usual, development and even human development provided by the market forces is going to be the central focus. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much. And we are going to take one question. Yes, the right person stood up. It's uh, difficult to signal from here. Hi, uh, my name is Grace Mueller. I'm a PhD student in geography. Uh, my question is for Sabina. Um, you mentioned that multi-dimensional poverty and in the indices are something that are measured versus modeled. I wondered if you could just expand methodologically what allows that to be true. Yeah. Um, what is the role of qualitative methods in that process? And maybe what classical economics might learn from those methods in the spirit of measuring versus modeling. Thank you. So I'll tell you what we will do now. Um, since a disproportionate amount was directed at Sabina, I have Sabina respond first, but then I'll give uh, two minutes each uh, for each of the speakers in case they want to add something. I'm afraid time won't allow for much more. Uh, I'm looking at Alak Sharma for these statements that I'm making for approval. So, uh, Sabina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and I will also be quick. Um, to Bina's question, uh, first about productive assets, we tried very hard and it's documented. There's a paper in World Development with Frank Vollmer. We tried to include in the global MPI the only possible things we could, which was land and livestock, and we could not. And we've documented exactly why. And it makes a huge difference in Ethiopia or in um, some countries where livestock and land are, are very significant assets. And so we have troubling findings, um, but we don't have comparable information on um, that. And there are very few data sets um, of DHS and MIX that have the ownership of productive assets by gender. So what we would like to do but haven't done is do studies of the existing data sets with gendered ownership of assets and other variables to be able to quantify individual level differences. And in terms of your second question on subjective data and environment, um, you are correct. I've tried, I cannot do an index that includes planetary boundaries. So what we will be doing is overlaying a subnational map of poverty with the subnational map by the planetary guardians of the planetary boundaries that are being transgressed. And so that will overlay human poverty and environmental poverty, in a sense. But you can't make a, a coherent index. At least I can't. I don't know how. So that's uh, quick. On subjective, we've done graphs um, of the two. And for poverty, there's no relation. But Pedro will say more, I'm sure. Very quickly, um, in terms of measured versus modeled and Grace's question, if you look um, beginning with literature by Ravalian, by Kanber, whatever, on intra-household inequalities, um, these are modeled uh, from household consumption data. And if you think of what you have, so the NFHS 5 has 2.8 million individual information. And for the household roster, you have the completed years of schooling of everybody above a certain age, for example or you have nutritional data for children, for women 15 to 49, a subsample of men. So you have individual data. And even if you have a household MPI, you still have that data underneath. So you can measure, okay, how many women versus men are undernourished, are there statistically, or girls versus boys, are there statistically significant differences? There are not. How about school attendance? And FHS4, yes, there were significantly different differences between girls and boys. How does it differ between poor people and non-poor people, um, which um, other things cannot do? And then what are the indicator specifications? How does the profile of deprivations change if you're poor versus non-poor, a girl versus a boy? And, and then uh, obviously the cross-household relationships. So I think you have to be very careful on sample size, cell values, all of that, but um, it's, a, it's a massive exercise. 
But I think in terms of economics, what it will do is just triangulate with other literatures, other definitions of poverty. And for qualitative work, you have to knock on doors, first to see if you're right, and then to deepen the understanding of potential things from the data that might be wrong. Um, sorry. No, thank you very much. Lord Desai, would you like to add something? Will you give it a pass? Yeah. Okay. I think the problem, I pointed this out long ago, that basically things like human development index are aggregate measures. And we really ask individual microeconomic questions about individual family uh, sort of fortunes. You know, which part of the poor actually is poor because of lack of family circumstances or lack of the social uh, schooling and things like that. Now, if you want to answer questions like that, you need a very different kind of approach in which the micro foundations of individual welfare has to be investigated, and we don't do that. We are doing group, group, and for example, I always said, you look at life expectancy, and if life expectancy is very high in a country, you like it very much. If I migrate from a poor country to a, to, to a country with a life expectancy, my life expectancy does not improve. My life is exactly what it was, because my life actually depends upon my circumstances, my schooling, my family background. Now, that kind of detailed question is very, very difficult for economists to answer. We try our best, but there will always be some more work to do. Thank God for that. We'll go on having jobs. <laughs> Dr. Concesio, in case you want to add something. Thank you, Kashik. Uh, I, I think just to answer Bina's question, yes, absolutely. And I, I gave some examples of the kind of uh, survey data that we're relying on. For instance, perceptions of insecurity. It doesn't mean whether this is real or not. If people feel they are threatened, they act and behave as if the threat is real. If they feel insecure, they trust others less. If they feel insecure, they tend to the extremes of the political polarization. So we look, do, trying to do a lot of work in understanding beliefs, dispersion of beliefs across population, across countries. And also, which was more directly to your question, how can we use a survey um, uh, qualitative data on well-being? And, and here there is a difference, for instance, between questions that ask about emotions. For instance, you, there are questions that ask people, do you feel anxious? Or did you feel anxious yesterday? Did you feel stressed? Others are more, are you satisfied with your life? That requires some cognitive processing. And it's interesting that, for instance, if you, if you look at life satisfaction, uh, women tend to report uh, systematically across the world higher levels of life satisfaction than men. If you ask, if you look at uh, the report on, on emotions, anxiety, for instance, or stress, it's the opposite. So I think we need to be careful about the way in which we interpret uh, uh, the, the information, the data. Um, but this is uh, ongoing work that we, that we are undertaking in the office. OK, it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, the speakers and the audience. Some first movers have already moved on for lunch. Let's take away that advantage from them. Thank you. Okay, so this brings us to the end of this very enriching, engaging plenary session one, set the tone and tempo for the rest of the discussions. Now we will break for lunch, and uh, this lunch is being hosted by Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, and uh, the Vice Chancellor of Gokhale Institute. Institute for Politics and Economics, Dr. Ranade is here, Ajit Ranade. We are very thankful to him. He's also a member of the board. Also, we do know that we have uh, short on time. We've gone <laughs> a little, we are running a little late. Would request you to take a quick lunch, uh, maybe 45 minutes, which is in the fountain lawn. There will be volunteers who will be helping you uh, to the fountain lawn. And after that, the uh, parallel thematic panels and sessions will begin. Uh, you can continue with the group photograph. Yes, please. I don't want them to keep standing. Oh. Yeah.
Yes, and thematic panel one, just the participants, thematic panel one is in uh, seminar hall two, Kamala Devi complex, which is right here. Thematic panel two is in conference room two, which is in the IIC main. Thematic panel three is in Terrace Pergola, which is again an IIC main building. Thematic panel four is in multi-purpose hall, which is right here. Thematic panel five is seminar hall three, which is upstairs. Round table on revisiting measurement of poverty is in seminar hall one, which is again in the same building. And the technical sessions, the technical session one is in We the People Hall, UN Lawns. Technical session two is in conference room one. Uh,